So it's really exciting to have Chin Mei, a gentleman here today who's the CEO and founder of the company, to tell you more about their journey. I'd also like to point out that our Association of University Research Parks in 2020 named this the best innovation company of any research park company that they awarded. And um, it's been one that, as I said, we've really been celebrating. And many of us that work in the building and in the research park have heard about for years. And we miss seeing them here every day. So we're excited for them to grow and prosper and have more customers and traction in the market. Chinmay, thanks for sharing your story today. Of course. Yeah. Thanks, Laura, for the introduction and all the amazing help that Laura and the rest of the Research Park Enterprise Works team has given us since 2016. It sounds kind of like crazy when you say it out loud. I'm going to take off my mask so the I'm not coming too muffled and I'm reasonably far away from everybody, so it should be fine. Um, I was thinking about what to say uh, during this talk, uh, you know, mostly speaking with uh, friends and sort of, you know, cohort of other startups. I figured it would be a good idea to give a talk that that's brief to begin with, uh, but that touches upon uh, sort of our origin story, our motivations, uh, a little bit on the startup strategy, technology strategy. Um, and then uh, finally, some operational details, you know, how we've raised funds, how we've leveraged uh, non-dilutive funding and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'd also very much prefer for this to be a conversation. So feel free to kind of stop me at any time, ask questions if you have uh, questions. Um, I'll try and keep it brief anyway. Maybe we're already at 1.15 or so, so I'll try to keep it at 20 minutes or so, so we can have a discussion afterwards. Uh, so the grand mission at EarthSense is to really create the level of AI that we need to sustainably and regeneratively manage our planet, right? Over the last couple hundred years, as all of you know, you know, the population of people has uh, exploded dramatically, and then we've had increasing amounts of impact on the natural world, um, and that's starting to really affect human civilization also. But that's kind of, you know, high-minded. Uh, really what it comes down to is uh, the living conditions for some of the p poorest people in the world, living in working conditions. Uh, so I'm originally from India, grew up there. Uh, EarthSense co-founder Girish is also from there. Uh, we actually went to the same school together from, since we were 10 years old. So we've been uh, great friends since we were 10 years old. Uh, a lot of our extended family is involved, extended families are involved in agriculture, so small-scale farming, you know, 5 acres, 10 acres, 20 acres, stuff like that, largely done manually or with, you know, literally like, you know, uh, bullocks uh, pulling plows and things like that, right? Uh, so very, very different uh, scenario from here. Um, and then I originally came to the U.S. back in 2002 to do my Ph.D. in bio-nanotechnology, focusing, uh, focusing on cancer diagnostic, cancer therapeutics, things like that. And I've always been on the border of, like, you know, I want to create new technology, but I also want to uh, commercialize it or see it achieve its full potential, uh, help people. Um, so uh, even when I was uh, doing my Ph.D. at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, uh, we filed, uh, I filed a couple of patents, three patents, two patents, something like that. Um, won a couple of business plan competition awards. Uh, so, you know, that was kind of that track that I was following. Uh, but right around the time uh, in 2007, 8, that I was starting to get close to graduation, uh, there was this huge spike of uh, farmers in India uh, committing suicide. So tens of thousands of farmers literally uh, committing suicide because of really untenable uh, economic and agronomic conditions. You know, they had lots of loans, uh, agricultural yield was failing, prices were falling, and, you know, they couldn't see any other way out. So that really shook me. Uh, I tried to figure out, you know, what I could do uh, that would help uh, farmers in India and, you know, similar situations happening in sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, you know, other parts of the world, too. Uh, so I went back uh, to India for about a year, 
uh, spend time on the ground working with people uh, and organizations. And, you know, as many of you can probably imagine, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the problems are more sort of socioeconomic, political, rather than something you can solve easily with technology. Uh, there was definitely room for advanced technologies uh, to help farmers, uh, but it wasn't a quick fix that I could do. Um, so there were kind of two paths at that point. You know, one was to maybe live in a village and, you know, spend 10, 15, 20 years there uh, and try to help. Uh, people there make their lives better, um, you know, affect a few thousand people. Uh, or to come back to our roots as technologists and try to figure out, like, okay, what are these emerging technologies that would really help farmers uh, that aren't being thought of as agricultural technologies, and how can we create uh, new forms of agriculture that makes lives better for, you know, everyone around the world, right? Um, so that really uh, brought me back uh, to the U.S., I started working on agricultural, uh, agricultural nanotechnology, agricultural biotechnology, and, you know, what better place to do that than here at uh, University of Illinois. So I was fortunate to get a postdoctoral fellowship uh, from the National Science Foundation to look at agricultural sustainability, uh, primarily to look at soil health. Um, and, you know, lots and lots of cool stuff to do from a microbiome science perspective, you know, improving agricultural practices to improve soils, improve soil microbiomes. Uh, but a lot of it came down to like, okay, yeah, we are kind of reinventing the wheel on how agriculture uh, should be done. Um, we've gone away from, you know, uh, as good as the Green Revolution has been, as successful as it has been uh, with respect to increasing yields uh, in agriculture. Um, it has had a lot of, you know, it has discarded, in some sense, a lot of the previous uh, sustainable agricultural practices. Uh, so, uh, and then looking forward, of course, you know, we're going to have 10 billion or more people uh, living on the planet uh, by 2050, um, and then yield increases are already starting to fall behind. Uh, so that's a big problem. Um, and then, you know, in addition to exploiting people, um, you know, whether it's in India or even farmers here, uh, we also exploit the planet uh, in most of the ways that we do agriculture. Um, so uh, that was kind of the, you know, uh, big moment of insight where, you know, we tried to figure out, like, okay, why are we doing agriculture this way? Uh, and essentially it comes down to, you know, the number of people involved in agriculture has been decreasing steadily uh, kind of all around the world. And we replaced uh, people and people's intelligence and efforts uh, with large-scale technologies that often end up promoting or being suitable just primarily for very large-scale uh, input-intensive monocultures, uh, which leads to all, uh, all of these problems. So we tried to figure out, like, okay, you know, AI is, again, starting to become a viable technology or finally starting to become a viable technology. Uh, how can we create robots and AI that uh, help farmers uh, help make sustainable agriculture possible all around the world at all different scales? So we very intentionally stayed, uh, have stayed with the much smaller uh, and very affordable uh, robot farm factor and done all the hard stuff on the software side uh, to make these smaller robots more and more useful. Um, and then the other thing we, you know, uh, very consciously made a decision on early on was to follow a very specific roadmap. We didn't want to start coming out with these technologies and start selling them to farmers immediately. You know, we had gone out and talked to farmers uh, as soon as we started thinking about this of, like, how they were using technologies. And this was right around the time, 2015, 16, this was right around the time when drones uh, were starting to become much more practical. Um, and what we found was that, yeah, you know, they were, as toys, they were okay, uh, but as useful, productive tools, they weren't really there yet. Um, so we intentionally um, developed this secret master plan, if you will, of going after the high-end uh, users of technology in agriculture, which often happens to be sort of the agricultural scientists, either in the public sector or private sector, 
who are really hungry for data and AI-driven insights and operations. And then as we mature the technology, uh, bring it out to farmers um, and make large-scale agriculture possible um, that's you know, uh, really changed through the use of these AI-based technologies. Um, and of course, you know, the kinds of technologies we were creating uh, would eventually help other industries too, but you know, we're, uh, we have our hands full with agriculture, so we don't see ourselves being involved in other industry verticals anytime soon. Um, and this was also, you know, based on my previous sort of entrepreneurial training. Uh, timing is one of the key issues. You know, being too early is often more uh, a cause of failure than being too late. Um, so, you know, the way we saw uh, one of the core technologies in agricultural robotics was, you know, uh, real-world autonomy, right? And we've seen through the example of self-driving cars that it is farther away than you think it should be. Um, and so we laid out a real path, a systematic path, of we could achieve increasing levels of autonomy uh, over the years. Um, and I'm happy to say that we've kind of really nailed the early prediction of when we would be able to achieve what. Uh, and then the other big part, of course, is cost, right? So, you know, when you start with the first electric cars, it's going to cost, you know, $150,000, $200,000, so obviously not a mass market car. So you want to figure out who the, you know, rich Hollywood celebrities are that you want to sell it to. And then as you continue to mature the technology, as you bring down the cost, then, of course, the objective is to create the mass market electric car. So same story on agriculture, except, you know, potentially even more uh, demanding cost constraints for farmers. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, path we laid out for ourselves, and that's, you know, essentially what we've been following uh, since 2017 when we uh, started making the first of these robots uh, at the university, uh, licensed out the technology, worked closely with the university technology office, um, and, you know, had collaborative research projects and so forth that we can talk about. Um, and then over time, we've been making more and more uh, sophisticated uh, and, you know, uh, robots with different functionalities. Um, so this was our first uh, commercial robot that we rolled out, um, you know, in a 3D printed form factor back in 2018, but then quickly sort of uh, zoomed in on, uh, quickly uh, focused on a scalable uh, design um, that we rolled out, commercialized in 2019, and then over the last three years, we've been sort of making significant iterations on it and making it much more uh, robust and scalable. Uh, and then, of course, there's a whole host of, like, you know, data analysis, AI, machine learning technologies, all the cloud-based uh, infrastructure for analyzing terabytes of data and all that kind of stuff. Uh, building on the same uh, platform, last year we made the next major robot, uh, which is a large-scale soil carbon sequestration solution. Uh, so, you know, same uh, core autonomy technology, simplified uh, onboard sensing and compute. Oh, I suck. Uh, but basically, this is a robot that will go through the field um, and just plant cover crop seeds, which is one of the, you know, as, as close as silver bullet solutions in agriculture, uh, helps with improving soils, helps bring down co farmers' costs off a variety of different inputs. Uh, but the bottleneck there has always been the cost of planting cover crops. Um, and see if we can make it work again. Uh, cost of planting cover crops and then the labor and hassle involved in planting cover crops. Uh, so with the robots, uh, we expect over time to bring down the cost of planting to under $3 per acre for sure, uh, and potentially even lower. Uh, so now, last year, we planted uh, a little over 100 acres uh, with these robots, and then, you know, this year we'll plan to do a few thousand acres, uh, and we already kind of have demand way uh, beyond that, but just, you know, in the spirit of growing uh, in a step-by-step -step manner, we're taking a, a cautious approach, conservative approach to scaling up, rather than trying to do too much too soon. Um, and then finally, you know, in addition to the TerraSentia data robot and the Terra uh, 
uh, cover crop planting robot. We're starting to make the big robot, which was one of the major reasons why we had to move out uh, to get access to a larger facility. Um, and this Terra Max robot, again, is designed for a few different applications, uh, but essentially designed to be a much larger payload carrier, uses all of the same autonomy and AI technologies as our smaller robots, but is able to do more uh, on the field. So again, the objective has always been to do things that conventional tractors uh, can't do, um, and then we you know, kind of zero in on specific uh, crops and specific use cases where these kinds of applications would be useful. Um, so that's kind of been the quick recap of what we've been up to over the last uh, uh, five years. Um, and let me, so this is sort of designed to be a modular platform where we can attach different tools to it and so forth. Um, all along, of course, we've been helped by, uh, you know, of course, Enterprise Works and the UIUC, uh, you know, close collaboration that we have. Gear still has a, a UIUC faculty position full time um, in computer science and ag engineering and a bunch of other departments. Uh, but we've also been invited to many other partnerships, like uh, by John, De John Deere, uh, Microsoft FarmBeats, uh, USDA, uh, been through a bunch of different accelerators uh, with, you know, varying level of interaction from the accelerators, um, and then, you know, have continued growing, as you can see. We need to update these graphs a little bit, but, you know, basically been growing uh, year over year pretty significantly across uh, that uh, our customers have collected with the TerraCentia robots. Um, and then we've uh, taken advantage of a lot of the non-dilutive funding, uh, specifically NSF, SBIR, Phase 1, and Phase 2 grants. Um, and then recently, last fall, we closed a $3 million uh, seed funding round, building upon our million-dollar uh, seed round, pre-seed round back in 2019. Um, been filing patents, um, actually in talks to file a few more patents right now, preparing three more patents. Um, I can probably skip this, but you know, the, this kind of the approach we're taking to building the uh, robotics and machine learning platform for managing the planet uh, and how we're a different way of looking at how we approach entering larger and larger markets. Um, all of this, of course, has been possible with our amazing team that's actually less than half of our current people. Uh, so we are 23 people now, seven in India, about 15 here that are full-time or since employees. Um, and then, you know, we also have a bunch of uh, student interns that we hire primarily during the summer, but um, throughout the year as well. So uh, a lot of the early work was done by student interns who became uh, full-time employees, and we continue to... Uh, get more interns and hope to hire more interns into full-time employees uh, as we go along. Um, so, let's see. I'm bad. 15 minutes. All right. uh, so, uh, that was a quick overview. We can talk in detail about how we've done various things or why we've done various things over the years. Um, love to have a conversation. Thanks. Yep. You talked about you had different sources of funding to grasp on your recent funding round um, with private investors. There's a whole variety in there. So yeah. you come back to that. But you did have SBIR funding early. Yes. How did that play a role of getting that non diluted funding? Which agency funded you to begin with? And how does that relate to your strategy today? I assume you're moving on to other sources of funding primarily at this point. Yeah. I mean, we're still... Uh, using our NSF Phase two funding. Uh, the NSF SBIR funding has been very, very, I would say, critical role, has played a critical role in getting us where we are. Uh, it took a few tries. Uh, so when we first started back in 2016, um, we were still uh, focusing primarily on robots in the air, or drones as we normally call them. And uh, when we sent uh, one... Uh, yeah, we, we submitted one 
uh, SBIR application based on that, based on a lot of customer discovery that we did. Um, and I think the, uh, the view from the S SBIR reviewers was like, yeah, not another drone startup, right? Because at that point, we were kind of towards the tail end of uh, drone excitement, maybe, uh, at least from a NSF or like emerging technologies perspective. Um, so that helped us. Uh, and then the other part, of course, was continuing customer discovery uh, helped us figure out that, yeah, you know, we could make drones slightly better, but most of what was missing in agricultural data was the lack of under canopy data, which drones were never going to get to. Uh, so that's why we started focusing or accelerated our ground robot development or ground drone development uh, much more. And then once we uh, based our SBIR proposal on that, uh, then we succeeded uh, at, uh, uh, with that uh, with that proposal. Um, we also submitted to USDA. Uh, personally, our experience was not uh, great. We weren't a good fit, I guess, for the program. Um, USDA has a smaller uh, pool of money, as far as I understand, for SBR, or used to back in 2016-17. Um, and then they also like to fund, I think, for their phase one SBIR awards, much earlier stage uh, projects, like concept stage projects almost, because we showed them like, hey, we have this picture of a first 3D printed prototype, and they're like, okay, why do you need our money? You already have a robot. It's like, no, this is like just the first, you know, uh, barely working prototype. Um, but NSF was uh, good, and then, you know, we were able to uh, take the make a lot of progress uh, with SBIR uh, that helped us you know get uh, private funding as well VC funding as well because once they saw that NSF was backing this they're like okay yeah you know, you're already de-risking this with outside money for the technology part uh, we'll pay you to start scaling up and for your like operational scale up expenses because. Um, most VCs we found don't really want to pay for, you know, kind of, unless you really go for like the deep tech VCs, which wasn't really a thing back then, I feel like. Um, they don't want to pay for the, you know, technology development or technology de risking. Um, so that helped a lot. Um, and then, of course, we uh, built on the phase one uh, feasibility results to. Uh, write a successful phase two award as well. Um, and now we're hoping to get like phase two B match and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, I think we've uh, sort of used up our NSF uh, support. Uh, and now it's mostly about generating more revenues from our enterprise customers and um, probably doing a larger VC round sometime soon as well. Uh, uh, so the vast majority of like of, of the 150 or so robots that we deployed over the last three four years, uh, they were built right here. Uh, we do source in a lot of the components, so there are things that we buy that are kind of you know semi customized or off the shelf components. Uh, from suppliers in China primarily. Uh, there are some local uh, sort of manufacturers that make the body shell of the robot. Um, all of the electronics inside the robot, like PCBs, uh, we've designed ourselves uh, starting in 2019, 20. Um, and those we get manufactured by a contract supplier. Uh, so yeah, all the parts get Manufactured elsewhere, and then we bring them in, and then you know assemble, do the software installation, QA testing, and then ship them out. Uh, we were, yeah, for the past couple of years, we were really bursting at the seams, even here in the rooms that we had. Uh, but because I guess many people could work from home, we were getting by. Uh, but now that we're building the larger robot, it literally couldn't fit through the doors, uh, so we had to find a place to that that would have like double doors and stuff. Um, 
Uh, there was something else I wanted to add. Uh, oh, we do a lot of 3D printing as well. So we started with like literally 3D printing the whole robot. Uh, we still 3D print uh, lots of components of the robots, you know, things that you would, at like thousands of units scale, you would probably do them with injection molding. But we've dialed in, yeah, we've dialed in our 3D printing quality to the extent that like, yeah, robots that we build Two years ago are still running and you know they're doing great. Uh, nothing's happened even to the 3D printed components. Yeah. So um, do you have to build it about one or two to start your Yeah, that's that's a fantastic question. So we see ourselves very much as a Illinois Heartland company. Um, and the three main reasons are talent, customers, and costs. Um, so, you know, for doing agriculture and technology, like, you couldn't ask for a better set of people that are interested, knowledgeable, and passionate about both of the, uh, all of these things, right? Um, so, uh, UIUC is one of the top ag schools. It's one of the top computer science robotics, you know, any engineering field, really, school. Um, and with the large student body that's like super hardworking, uh, we uh, were able to make really amazing early progress with just the student interns that we had. And, you know, we were able to uh, convince several of them to uh, stick with the company rather than go uh, join Google or Amazon or SpaceX, although we've trained several people that have done exactly that. So that's the caliber of people that we get here. Um, and then, of course, you know, because we are uh, an ag-focused company, uh, specifically going after the very large acreage, you know, row crops, commodity crops, um, it makes no sense for us to relocate to, like, you know, Silicon Valley or somewhere, right? Um, I feel like there's already, like, 10 strawberry harvesting startups in the Bay Area, so I don't feel any urgency to uh, even establish an office there. Although we have lots of people in Central Valley that have approached us over the years of like, hey, can we start using your robots? Because they are, again, facing the same problem. They're, they're using drone data and satellite data, and it's not really particularly useful. Uh, so we're working with several of them, um, and we'll continue to expand our business there. Um, and then finally, you know, cost is one of the biggest uh, determinants of startup success or failure, I feel like, um, and having cost of living that's a third of, you know, San Jose uh, is not bad at all. Uh, we've seen, we were able to get a sneak peek into a big name ag tech startup that had to fold a couple of years ago, uh, a year ago, and they burned through like $12 million in two years just on their engineering talent. Um, and they did a lot less than what we've done. They built, they built like two robots. Uh, they were slightly larger robots, but still. Um, so, you know, relative to that, you know, the cost effectiveness, uh, cost of innovation, cost of actually commercializing uh, technologically intensive products is very, very favorable here. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll be sticking around for the foreseeable future. Successful asterisks. <laughs> yeah. Yes. To, to, always, like, you know, yeah. But anyway, yeah, no, that, that's a fantastic question. I think it, uh, it has to be, I feel like, uh, something that you've always wanted to do. Uh, you can't be like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm dedicated to becoming a faculty member and haven't done any kind of entrepreneurial stuff. Uh, even like dabbling or training or education or whatever, and then suddenly make a shift. Um, and then the other part is uh, that that transition takes time, and you got to allow yourself uh, the time to make that transition, have the support structure in place, have the um, sort of, you know, folks like you helping us make that transition more uh, smoothly. Uh, but, you know, personally, I would – 
very, very strongly recommended. Like the last five, six years has been the least boring uh, period of my life, and I get bored pretty easily. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I keep switching what I do every five or six years, and I don't see myself switching out of this anytime soon. Uh, so I don't know if that's like specifically helpful, but uh, yeah, I think like having that inclination. Um, and then being able to, being open to, uh, or uh, understanding that, yeah, there, there's things that you do as engineer or scientist that will apply, like, you know, data-driven decision-making, hypothesis-driven, uh, you know, decision-making, problem-solving, those are good. But then there are other things like, you know, how do you handle sales and marketing and, you know, recruiting and things like that that, probably are not the same things as writing, like there are things that you can take from NSF grant writing to writing a business plan to pitching to VCs uh, to like selling to customers, but they're not exactly the same thing. So you have to kind of go back to school, read lots of books, talk to lots of smart people experienced in these skills that you don't currently have and sort of consciously train yourself to uh, act and behave in slightly different ways that are maybe a little bit foreign to you. Yeah? Back on the professional side of things as well for you and your journey. You are a postdoc here at U of I, but yeah. you co-founded it with a professor from the university. Yes. Sometimes faculty want to launch something on their own, and we generally will say, find a postdoc. Yes. Find a grad student to be your early founder. Can yeah. you talk about that relationship with the faculty co-founder and uh, maybe a little bit of your advice for other postdocs or grad students who want to think about launching from research at the university. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very important point. Uh, being a startup founder is not a part-time job. It's not something that even a team of part-time people can do well, I feel like. Uh, you know, I think many of us probably know other part-time teams that have tried it and kind of sort of works for a couple of years, but then, you know, it's hard to keep that going. Um, and, yeah, so, uh, honestly, like, Girish works very hard. He has, uh, you know, a full-time job at the university and basically a full-time job at EarthSense, but it takes more than that. Like, for any faculty that have a job at the university, I would definitely recommend, like, yeah, you've got to have somebody that you can rely on to do this as a full-time, you know, I don't know, 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week, I don't know, uh, job for two, three years until it really starts taking off, right? So having that kind of uh, perseverance and endurance is important. Um, and I, I've been lucky to be, to have had the opportunity to do, uh, sort of beta test it, I guess, once with soil diagnostics. Where Kausub started the company, he was still doing the same thing, and then I came by and helped him kind of get it off the ground for the first six months or so, me and Ben, and our XEO photo is still up there. Uh, so, um, but then I had to go back, and then it was all back on Kausub, and, you know, it's doing well, but it's doing something different from what we originally started, and it came down to sort of the number of hours a person has in their life every day, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, having at least one full-time person for the first year um, and one or two half-time people is, I think, a bare minimum, um, and that's tough. Does that answer the question? Hmm. Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I will let you know when I've done all of that. <laughs> but no, I mean, seriously, so I think the sort of more widely applicable answer to that is things are going to take a lot longer than you expect. Um, and like, you wouldn't do a startup if you 
actually knew how long it was going to take and how difficult it was going to be. It takes a certain amount of sort of naive, irrational optimism to start a startup. Um, but, you know, even when things are going really well and you're talking to the, all these customers um, and you're developing these new technologies, new products, um, the products and technologies themselves are going to take a lot longer because there's lots of unknown unknowns that you have to tackle uh, to actually create a good product. And then your customers have their own, you know, timelines and objectives and constraints. So they will, even if they initially say, well, our customers, even if we, even when they initially said, oh, yeah, you know, this will be great, then uh, we'd love to start scaling up as soon as possible. It's, you know, slower than you think. Um, so you have to face a lot of sort of, you know, uh, knows to keep making progress. Um, you know, same thing with fundraising from VCs. You know, I guess the yield is like success rate is maybe 5% less than that. So you'll have lots and lots and lots of conversations. But as long as you approach every training, every, every interaction with like a learning mindset to say, okay, you know, what am I learning from this? How do I? use this experience to make the next thing better, um, that's good. If the no's uh, start kind of psychologically weighing you down, then, you know, it's hard to keep going, right? And um, so that's partly why I said, like, the last five years has been the least boring part of my time because every day I'm learning something new, right? And I'm learning something completely different, right? So one day I'm working on website design, one day I'm working on like marketing, messaging and strategy and, you know, sales materials and, you know, really understanding customer problems, you know, figuring out technology, figuring out new sensors we're going to integrate in the robot. So it's like all over the place and like wearing all these different hats and doing all these different things is great. But at the same time, like with a small team doing all of these unreasonably demanding things, uh, it takes longer than you uh, expect. Um, so that, that's the primary obstacle, I think. Like, it takes longer and costs more, uh, and you make less money than you project or expect or hope. Uh, so um, having a support structure of, like, you know, my wife has a decent job, and I, for the first three, four years, since 2017 through 2021, I didn't get take any salary from our sense because I was focusing on like spending all the money on the engineers uh, who were actually doing the work. Uh, so having that freedom helps. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, just like psychological and moral support from people around you and having sort of internal resilience to kind of ignore or like wake the weight the failures less and weight the success as more psychologically um, is what keeps most entrepreneurs going, I think. Sure. Who may have been some of the mentors that you've worked with and what are some of the more important things that you've learned from your mentors? It's uh, a great question. Um, mostly the mentors that we've learned the most from are people that have the skills that we don't, right? So business people, sales folks, people in the ag industry, you know, farmers that we speak with or work closely with. Um, so that, cause that's primary. And then, you know, uh, other uh, successful entrepreneurs as well who've done their own uh, successful or unsuccessful uh, technology startups and learning from who've been open to uh, helping us learn from their mistakes and their successes. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, understanding as quickly as possible what you don't know and what you're not good at, and then finding those mentors that can help you boost those skills and help you, like, support you in uh, those functions, um, like sales, for example, or marketing, or business plan development, or venture capital fundraising, you know, any of these things that I hadn't done before. Um, and then, of course, you know, figuring out how the agriculture industry works. Um, so all, all of those kinds of things, uh, things that you don't know, you know, people who will help you understand what you don't know. 
um, and we'll help you uh, understand those things and bring up your skills uh, in those areas. Some of those mentors have also invested in our sense, so uh, many of those mentors actually. So, uh, you know, I think we've made a good impression on the mentors and, you know, learned uh, from them well and made good progress. So, yeah, works out pretty well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. How we recruit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it helps to have a pretty strong tie with the university, with Girish working there. We have, you know, lots of federal funding purely at the university uh, for, like, university research projects that have the... Uh, a broad set of collaborators uh, across different colleges and things like that. Um, so we're, and then, you know, everybody knows that uh, Ertzins is also supporting those projects, right? So we, um, so we, we approach that collaboratively. Um, that's led to a lot of success with the first um, NSF USDA funded agricultural AI institute coming here. Um, so, and then recruiting, you know, we worked with, uh, you know, the, the most success we've had was working with uh, student groups, uh, various RSO, like the first robotics, is that the name? I think, like robotics RSOs, um, and recruiting people there. Um, and so, you know, uh, it, it has a, its own... Uh, self-reinforcing effect. Once people know that you're working on some cool stuff, they want, you know, a few people want to work with you and then their friends hear about it and, you know, uh, they want to work with you. Um, so it uh, definitely helps to have strong interactions with uh, various student groups where people are interested in technology, innovation, invention, you know, just tinkering around, working hard beyond just, like, classwork. Uh, of which there's a huge uh, community at, uh, at the university already anyway. Um, and then uh, in terms of recruiting, yeah, we, we've essentially uh, leveraged the same network to say, yeah, you know, we, we're looking for such and such. Typically, we already have a few candidates in mind because we've been working with them on the university research projects or know them from sort of, you know, their... Uh, independent study or, you know, research position at the university lab. Um, so we've, we've consciously sort of maintained and built that pipeline uh, and recruited people to work on either at AdWordSense or uh, sort of more forward-looking projects at the university. Um, and then sort of the, you know, normal channels like uh, posting jobs on Handshake, we get a pretty solid uh, set of respondents, applicants on that as well. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, definitely. So that's why I said, like, we intentionally started out by uh, not going after farmers as our first customers, right? We've always focused on the agricultural researchers, whether at, like, the large global seed and agrochemicals companies or at the leading universities, like, you know, Cornell, Wisconsin, of course, UIUC, Iowa State, you know, all, all the universities that you can think of. Um, so uh, that's been the primary early adopter set. And even there, you know, different people have different uh, risk tolerance or sort of, you know, uh, appetite for dealing with the hassle of early stage 
technology, um, sort of, you know, beta scale products. Um, and we've asked people to, so we've been honest with people. They will say, hey, you know, we think this is a good idea. It's only going to become a full-fledged useful uh, thing for you if you engage with this at this, you know, slightly painful stage. Um, and we've uh, tried to be uh, very uh, generous, if uh, that's the word I want to use. I mean, they've, they've definitely been generous to us in their time, and we've been generous to them with our time and resources as much as we can. And there are a few people that have said, yeah, you know, I would like to use this when it's ready, but it's not ready for me yet. Um, and we've kind of, you know, put those relationships on pause. Um, and then similarly for farmers as well, like we get, you know, uh, lots of inbound interest for farm, from farmers and say, hey, you know, when can I start using our robot? And often my answer is like, it's not really ready for you yet. So we haven't pushed uh, an expensive, you know, useless thing on farmers because A, it's not the right, right thing to do, and B, it's just going to destroy trust which you can never win back. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of been the core part of our strategy is to sell the right product to the right people at the right time. Um, and we accept that it's going to be a while before all the farmers all around the world are going to be using our robots, but uh, you know, we want to build our way towards it. Sure. Good. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.